I remember my chief digital officer at the time, she sat uh, us all down, all the leaders, and she read an email of 75 year old lady who did not get her order. Uh, it was right in the height of COVID. She's like, am I gonna get food? Am I gonna starve? Like I waited all night on my porch for my order and you guys didn't even send me an email. I think the fundamental thing that companies forget, there are people on the other side. They're waiting for their food. My son right now is waiting for his tennis shoes. He's very distraught every day. People are waiting for their things and they, they're disappointed or excited and companies forget that sometimes. Customer experience can make or break a brand, but what happens when your internal teams aren't speaking the same language? That's our topic today on the Frictionless Experience, the podcast where we lay waste to digital friction. I'm Chuck Moxley. And I'm Nick Palladino. And today we're talking with Angel Singh, VP Customer Experience at Petco. Angel brings her extensive experience from top retailers like Home Depot, Albertsons, Sephora, and Petco to reveal the critical role that team structure and collaboration play in delivering a frictionless experience. Now, whether you're in retail, or tech, or any customer facing industry, the insights from today's episode is going to help you rethink how your teams can work better together to delight your customers at every touch point. Angel, welcome to the Thank frictionless you. experience studio. We're glad to have you here. Now, Nick and I have been dying to hear about the birth of a new venture for you. I, th I th guess it's a side hustle. It's not your day job is at Petco, but side hustle. You created a new game, yes. correct? Tell, tell us about that. And yeah. How that came we created, about. Uh, my husband and I, and one of my um, colleagues, we created a game company. So, uh, we had a couple of different ideas. Uh, anyone who's ever started a business knows that there's all those little things um, they take up a lot of time and work. So we started with a small venture. Uh, the first one is uh, Luchador Legends. It's a card game. Um, and it's it's been really fun to like try it out, do the imagery, the marketing, the gameplay, rules, printing, all of, all of the things that go into games. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of different ideas. And my husband's working on uh, a Renaissance LARPing tabletop game so that will be coming out pretty soon uh, probably in this fall winter we'll be doing uh, a kickstarter campaign for luchador legends the card game and so we're really excited uh it is a it's a side hustle <laughs> it's it's not a full-time gig it's one of those dreams i'm like maybe maybe someday but um it's funny because it, it goes back into it's all the same kind of work that your day job has thinking about the customer thinking about all of the pieces and the sequencing. Uh, but this is just a, is a fun thing that I get to do kind of on the side. That's so awesome. I love board games. Been um, in and around board games my whole life, obviously, but more recently than not, I've been getting into more that you go to the game store, you don't go to Target or you go to Walmart. You, it's, it's a very different type of game because it really gets you in, engulfed into this like imagination land if you will and i i love that aspect of of just allowing yourself to just take a moment enjoy with friends and then just kick back and relax but especially when you get into niche games um i got into a few different board games actually a few of them on the shelf right here but got into a few different board games that were just created by some person that just wanted to create a game yeah. and that's it they don't even have it produced like they they would get it professionally printed and then they would assemble it in their own house yeah. And then they'd sell the game. And it's just so amazing how intricate the decisions are inside each of those. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like, been kind of fun because uh, you find these like closet gamers that it's almost like they're embarrassed to say like, oh, I play games. And then there's these ones that are like on multi, I don't even want to say day, like multi-month campaigns. And it's like everybody has their different like niche. There's, you know, uh, card games, tabletop games, campaign, RPG sort of games. It's like a plethora of different things. And uh, we have a ton of games. I don't have them behind me, <laughs> but we have them in closets. And I think it's just, it's a special kind of thing. It's, you know, getting to spend time with family and friends 
and then like you said kind of go and escape and be in a different world so we're we're expanding you know our tribe I guess and so hopefully you know the the card game was probably a really simplistic game but it had so many things that we had to think about to to get it to a production ready um but we have some really complicated like games that we've been kind of thinking through but if you're really thinking about like the the meeples and the printing of the board and like all of the compartments right. and the cards like it starts to get kind of expensive and so we wanted to start like kind of on the down low and not disappoint people before we <laughs> made this very complicated game so it's a it's a fun it's a fun experience you should try uh, your own game board super... someday oh <laughs> I that, can that's, tell. that's a little that's a little <laughs> much for me i maybe maybe that sounds exciting but i'm definitely excited about the kickstarter yeah. So I, I can't yeah. wait to see that release. I'll let you guys know. So so Angel, tell us about your role at Petco and what you and your team are working yeah. on. Yeah, so I lead a couple different things. Um, customer experience, uh, UX, UX research, um, but then also building out technologies. And so I think when people think about customer experience, uh, they probably think about like the front facing side. And I would say like the easy side of uh, the experience of, you know, making it flawless and seamless, but there's a lot of work that goes into to making that actually happen. And so I, I would say foundational piece is, do you know who your customers are? Uh, a lot of retailers don't know who their customers are. And so they have to data mine basically and figure out who those customers are through data and research. And so a lot of my team is uh, also on the technical side, trying to understand who the customers are and what are the experiences that they should have um, and the things that are not necessarily working today that we could kind of help and build um, like a future future state for them. I think that's a, a really profound aspect though, because not knowing who your customers mm -hmm. are, yet assuming your customers are the same as your competitor. That is just a fatal flaw that I see over and over and over again, because if you assume your customers are your competitors' customers, then you're ignoring the fact that your brand resonates with certain people for a very specific reason. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, I always come in uh, in new roles, be it Sephora, Home Depot, or, uh, Albertsons, and, and it's like, who are our customers? And there's like some base things that uh, companies usually have, and it's it's either personas or segment work, and it's it's kind of bringing that like person um, to life. And so, you'd be surprised how many companies I'm not going to say who, how many companies don't actually know who their customers are um, at all, uh, or they assume. And so that's like you said, that's a very dangerous pass pass because you're building experiences, you're buying products, you're doing pricing and you're spending a lot on marketing to kind of acquire these customers. And so are you acquiring customers that are actually uh, your better customers or the customers who are just like wanting a deal? And so that's usually where I start of like, who are your, our customers? Uh, are they the right customers? And I don't like to like be very generational, but there's a different generational spend. And so there's the existing customer base. And if they're of an older generation, um, then they are going to phase out and not necessarily spend so much. So you kind of always have to think, who are your customers and who are the customers that you want to acquire and keep in the back pocket that there's a whole new generation that like even um, my son is the generation alpha generation. Um, you have to start thinking about them and figuring out how you can start to acquire them and get them like interested in your brand, even at a young age. And Home Depot is really good at that. Anyone who's ever gone to uh, a kid's clinic to like build bird houses or something like that, that is getting um, children in with their parents and they have memories. And so we have people that worked at Home Depot that had memories of smelling sawdust and going in with their dad and you know, their dad was going in and getting plumbing or something, but they were building the birdhouse. And so where do they go when they're building their own houses with their family? Because they have that memory. And so you really need to think about that um, as you're, you're doing your customer 
experience and research. And and I would think with that alpha generation and these new generations, they're going to be even more tech savvy, have higher expectations for that yeah. for that uh, digital experience. How are you guys thinking about that and starting to anticipate and starting to measure and starting to make sure that they're getting a good experience? Yeah, I, I've worked at, I would say, like a spectrum of uh, different companies that have different experiences. And so if you've ever tried to go to a website and it just takes a long time or it's clunky, you instantly leave. Um, I think as the generations are younger and younger, they have less patience to like deal with being able to log in and check out easily. Or if you have to like enter your credit card and you don't have like Apple Pay or something like that, those are things that are like blockers to get like younger generations in. But I think you really need to think like any any um, experience, like you said, technology, retail, uh, any services, you have to have like a seamless, frictionless experience. And people say that all the time, it's quite difficult to do, um, but you have to do it and you have to be quick, easy, painless, and just like get them through. But then also you have to think about all your different channels. Uh, if you have a call center, if you have your marketing channels, if you have a uh, brick and mortar, all of those things need to be seamless and you need to think about the customer because the last thing you want a customer to do is like try to get questions answered, call the call center and they're like, who are you? And it's like, I spent a lot of money with you. Like, how do you not know? I just ordered something. So all of that needs to be seamless. And again, it's, it's technology, it's data, it's understanding. And um, I've been saying a lot of technology, but it's also how the teams work with each other. Um, you can go in and, and figure out how organizations are organized uh, by seeing disparate views of how they treat the customers. Like marketing might treat and talk about customers in one way, the store might do it in another way, the digital experience in another. You can see the silos uh, with the organization in that way. And so they really need to be broken down and the customers, uh, the company's focus needs to be like number one customer, not who they report into, who their customer is, is their number one thing that they need to think through. In fact, that's something we talked about on the prep call that the structure of teams within a company can really have a big impact on customer experience, yeah. uh, whether they're collaborating well or they're creating silos. Um, talk about, because you've worked a lot of major brands, how did the, how are the teams structured at these companies and how did that impact the customer experience? Yeah, so I'll, I've been kind of lucky in most regards of a lot of my roles have been cross-functional. And so we, I, I don't want to say we sit on top of uh, teams, but we sit in parallel with teams. And so either we are at service for the teams and at service for the customer. And so uh, even if I'm building technologies, I kind of have to think about like, who's my internal customer who are building my, or using my tools and who's my external customers who are actually seeing the output of it. Um, so I think most of the time, a good organizations, they have teams that think about, like I said, the internal customer and the external customer and kind of sit across and run through. So if I've been building out like marketing technology platforms or customer experience, uh, I work with the technology team, the operations, the merchandising team, the marketing team, the digital e-commerce team, and the store team. And so it doesn't necessarily matter. I just try to figure out all of the different touch points the customer might have and work through that and then solve any friction points or gaps or anything that might be of an issue. Now, when it gets a little bit problematic or problematic is basically uh, you'll get stopped by a team that's kind of has their own initiatives and goals. Uh, yes, they think about the customer, but they're thinking about their own like pricing or you know their technology that they're running or you know whatever. Um, I've been at companies that actually have terrible issues where they don't think about like retention. There's nobody who owns retention or churn, and so when you don't have an owner for a problem, then you don't have a fix for a problem either, and so it. It gets really difficult when um, 
companies and teams are structured in very siloed kind of vertical ways instead of a horizontal view. It also results in a bunch of KPIs, a very specific measure that is very siloed as well. And so by by not having that. If you have ever got to sit in uh, day long or half day long meetings, uh, executive meetings, they are full of KPIs and it will be a lot of spend and conversion. And then when you really boil it down, it's like, Somehow we're down in revenue, but we've got all these new customers, but we're also like have a high churn, but we're <laughs> marketing spend is great. And it's like, what? <laughs> so yes, it's, it's basically, I think you should have like three or four business KPIs and customer KPIs. And all of those teams need to be marching towards that instead of their separate siloed OKRs and KPIs. It, it doesn't ever work. And you're always, you know, golden for some reason, but somehow the business is still not making money. So why do you think connecting teams and, and getting this harmony is more often more difficult than say connecting systems or experiences? I think it goes back to the way uh, top down and sometimes bottom up uh, organizations are. Uh, you'll have like a chief digital officer, you'll have a CMO, you'll have a CTO, uh, CFO, and all of those um, Chiefs basically have their their siloed teams underneath them, the chief merchants as well. Um, yes, they're all supposed to be, you know, working for the, the business and the company, but sometimes it, it gets lost in the different levels from VPs and the directors. And so I think it's been interesting to see where some companies are, you know, they're kind of playing with, do we have a customer officer or a digital officer? Or maybe we're not going to have a CMO anymore. And so I think it, I'm really interested to see where that goes, because I think that has been a big part of what's damaging, I think, some of the, the company's experiences with the customer. Um, I think a chief customer officer is really good, but if they don't have power over the technology and the merchant, merchandising and marketing, then they really actually don't have power to make the customer experience better. And so I think, you know, organizationally, it needs to be set up and the, the teams need to figure out like, yes, we have our own OKRs and budgets. It usually goes down to budgets. You want your big budgets to build your team and get your, your tools, but they need to figure out how to work together because that's, that's basically the biggest pain point I've noticed you can build these really great technologies and have these wonderful strategies. But if you get stopped by the organizational politics sometimes, then it really just creates these really uh, bad experiences for the customer and, and for the teams that work, work on it. What are some strategies that you found are effective in overcoming this challenge, either as an individual contributor or at what companies have gotten that right? Yeah, I think, I think one, it's always easier to go to a company who's very customer centric. Um, you know, Sephora was probably, Sephora and Home Depot were probably the most customer centric companies that I worked at. Um, and obviously they're very successful. Uh, you could get, a, somebody could write a note to the CEO and I could get that note back and I would have to fix whatever like the customer said, like I didn't get my, at Albertsons, I didn't get my order on time. Uh, the chief digital officer came directly to me and said, you need to like figure out how to fix these kind of things. So I think when you take what the customer, when the company takes what the customer says of an importance and it jumps and it reacts to it in a positive way, of course, then I think that's a really great place uh, to work. Also, if, you know, the organization builds out teams like my team that kind of work through personalization or customer experience and have these teams built in a, a proper way. So like I said, under my team, I have a technology team, I have an analytics team, and I have a UX team. And that really enables me to be able to, to do the job that I got hired to do and make the best experience for the customer. If UX lives somewhere else, that would make it really difficult to like be to understand what the user experience and and kind of the research and um, the findings for the customer would be. Same thing with technology. If I don't necessarily get a say or impact on the technology and the data that we're building, that would be also kind of harmful. So 
I think, you know, setting up the teams for success, um, but then it's also on the leaders to build out really great partnerships with your peers. Um, so I had uh, partners in marketing, like I said, technology, merchandising, digital. And I really worked hard to evangelize because when I left a room after I was like spouting all of these great things, I wanted them to like be bought in and think, yeah, we really need to personalize and make this experience better. And so they could take it and then work with their teams to uh, to do the things that we were suggesting. So it's really it's really a partnership of trying to make it better, but you really have to you have to be kind of buttoned up. You have to know the customer, know the strategy, know the business value, the OKRs, the success. So metrics, when you're a and startup to those things and well. you first get going and you start acquiring customers, it's pretty obvious that the, you have to listen to your customers. So where along the line from being a startup to being a Fortune 500 company, do companies stop doing that? And how do they write the ship? Because that's that to me is the most profound aspect coming here. So you're telling me these mega companies are actually focusing on the customer, but so do startups, right? And they have to or else they fail. So where, where are companies missing this and where does it go awry that, that we need to, to help write that? mentality. I guess that's, that's where my thought goes. Yeah. I, yeah. And I think you hit on something and I'll answer your question in a second, but there's a lot of startups in, I think some of these technology spaces that have traditionally been held by like these giant technology companies and they're focusing on the customer and the problem set more than some of these beer companies and their market share is getting eaten slowly but surely. And so I think there's going to be a change with some of these um, technologies, but also in retail. And so we had a lot of, when I was at Sephora, we had a lot of smaller, um, you know, customer companies kind of coming in and really focusing on niche brands and customers and they were taking big shares of you know of sephora so i think companies just don't have the luxury anymore uh, we have all these different generations that they want to be uh, special and they want they just don't have patience again and so i think you can't lose sight of the customer I think what happens with bigger companies is basically they get really big. Uh, they start to have like these, these giant teams. Like again, they'll have, you know, uh, a giant 300 person product team um, and the product owner, I'll just give you an example from some of my experiences of like the pro one product owner will own a piece of the checkout, the banner here, um, you know, on the home page, this subsection of the website, and same with the business team and same with the technology team. And so they don't see the whole experience anymore. They see slices of it. And so they're super focused. So sometimes you just get too big and your teams are not set up to look at the full picture anymore. And so I think that's what kind of happens. And again, it's the executives are just looking at a slice and not the full picture and not the full customer. Then. Um, they lose sight. And what's really interesting is I not going to say the company, but I was at a company and we didn't even look at like NPS scores or customer scores. Like that was not a part of our OKRs. And so, but we looked at revenue, we looked at EBITDA, we looked at uh, churn, but we didn't actually look at like what our customers were saying. And it was funny because I was sat in a couple of meetings and, you know, I had the data in front of me. And the customers were saying, like, I couldn't go through checkout. Like I had I was in this login swirl. Um, and we didn't we didn't look at it. And it had been going on for months. And so it's like, yeah, you need to fix these things because that's the customers are telling us what's wrong and what they don't like, and we're ignoring them. And it's just it's painful. <laughs> I have several experiences where I'm amazed that I actually finished my my checkout. I think about it all the time where I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm over here talking about building frictionless experiences and how much it matters, yet I push through all these terrible experiences yeah. so often. But uh, not everyone yeah. does, but I'm no. so much more aware of it because I do this literally every day. But 
man, there are so many times like uh, it, my credit card won't be accepted or the address field won't won't fill out or the checkout page won't render. And I'm like, what am I doing that creates all yeah. this? Because it happens so well, frequently. And it's, it's kind of funny because I was just talking to someone and companies like, you know, if you're a Fortune 50, Fortune 500, you, you have like these huge platforms. You're on, you know, the Adobe, the Salesforce, you know, what whatever you are. They're so hard. And you have hundreds of people to like keep these things updated. Shopify is so nice. Like it's so easy. But you know, it's just it goes back to the startups are starting to think about, you know, how can we make something super complicated, super kind of hyper personalized, but super easy. Um, where a lot of other companies would like you go onto, you know, any any website. There's all these bells and whistles. You don't need all that stuff sometimes. You just, like you said, you want to log in, you want to put your thing in your cart, and you want to check out, and you want to get an email confirmation. It's really easy. But, you know, there's 5,000 people employed to, like, do this loyalty thing or this social, you know, widget on the website. And it's like, well, yeah, but does it actually make people convert and happy and uh, delighted? Not necessarily. So, yeah, I I think the fundamentals need to be fixed on a lot of a lot of companies' websites and experiences, and even the in store experiences. Like POS systems, I think are like back in the 1980s or something. Those things are the clunkiest clunkiest piece of technology I've ever had to deal with. Well, that's a great, great uh, transition because we had talked about technology and you kind of touched on it, but the challenges of integrating those technologies to, to create that frictionless experience. Um, what, what are some of the biggest challenges you face when trying to integrate all these different technologies and systems across all the touch points? Because you do have in-store in all of, it seems like in all of your experiences, you've worked with both in-store and digital or what we've called digital. We've had a number of guests talk about how do you how do you integrate all those technologies and get that seamless experience? Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll kind of answer your question in in, in a different sort of way. Um, you'll always get these kind of experiences or asks from your executives and and teams to to create like a frictionless experience or a personalized experience. Those are my two favorite. Like, I have three favorite things I get asked to do: like reduce churn. Um, you know, well, more more than three, four, like acquire new customers, reduce churn, create personalized experiences, and then um, make fris- frictionless experiences cross-channel. And so again, like marketing, digital, all of that is super hard. And so if you come in kind of like with this business mindset, um, where do you even start? Like it, it's really hard. And I think as you, as I've like, matured in this this realm it always boils down to do we have the data on the customers and then then is our technology integrated and then our our processes and teams kind of integrated and talking to each other um and always the answer is no on all of those things like we don't have the data (laughs) it's silo and so you kind of have to think through it very tactical very strategic connect the dots and go down to like all of these different technologies. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a technologist. I'm, I'm not an engineer, but I do have to kind of think about how these things are kind of architected to a certain degree, because one, they're used by internal users. So they can't be like clunky and terrible. They can't be over-engineered or you're going to have engineers working on business tools instead of like internal team members. Um, and then are, are they Frankentech or are they talking to each other? Are they like an enterprise suite? Are they expensive? Are they cheap? Like all of these different sort of things. And then you have to show that you've actually brought value to the company. The CEO is like, hey, you've been working on this personalization thing for like ever, but I still don't. I can't remember, but uh, I remember the CEO. I still, I buy white wine. Why do I still get red wine? in my uh, emails, it's like, 
not there yet. We're close. <laughs> We're very close. So you always have to show like these things take millions of dollars and lots of time, but you have to show that some kind of value and use case with um, whatever project you're working on. And the technology is always changing, like always changing. Um, the last three years has been, well, sorry, five years has been machine learning and AI that had to be introduced into all of the things that we're doing, even if it's kind of like faking it to a certain degree, but we had to like start to introduce like machine learning into a lot of our um, processes. And then we had to figure out how would we use AI in creating like content supply chains at a faster speed for personalization. And so you just have to always be, you're, you're running, you're always running and trying to figure out how to do these different things. And like I said, digital is pretty fast moving. Then you have store. Store is so slow. Like, you know, there's fulfillment and that's actually getting pretty cool. With, there's lots of different robotics and, um, you know, AI in uh, a, your supply chain, but the store POS system and, you know, thinking about when do you use digital in store? Like we've tried kiosks. I've tried kiosks for like 15 years in store. Uh, for certain things or CMSs and stores and displays. Customers just still, they're, they're not grabbing it as much as you would think, even though you try to make their lives easier. So you're always testing, you're trying it, testing. And it's like, okay, maybe this is the year of the kiosk. Like maybe customers will use kiosks to make their lives easier. And, and I think McDonald's is actually having really great success with it. So that's, that's cool. Maybe it will be a start for the rest of us, but yeah, you're, you're always trying, figuring it out, um, and just keeping, keeping up with the technology. So I was just talking to somebody last week who, who said their dad will not go to McDonald's because he refuses to use the kiosk, and that's the only way you can order now. Oh. <laughs> so those, oh, that older generation, they're going, I'm not going to a place that requires yeah. the kiosk. I'm out. I'm, I'm checking out. I feel like I am that older generation, though. Like, I, and I know I'm literally not. But I feel like I, I'm so resistant to new things. You, you mentioned Apple Pay earlier and how younger generations have to have Apple Pay. I am so like frightened of Apple Pay and Google Pay and all these things that like bring it yeah. together. The American Express started to do this new thing where they'll they have a digital card. So I'm not actually sending my real credit card to them. And even that freaks me out. Like, what do you mean I'm not sending my real credit card to them? Like, that's, it's not, something's gonna, not gonna work. Something's gonna break. I don't, I don't wanna do that. I wanna send my card to them. I don't, I'll, I'll solve it if they steal it. I, like, I, I just, I am that old yeah. person. But You're an old I'm soul. Not. You're an old soul. Yeah. Well, so I started to use Google <laughs> Wallet more than ever. And I love it. It's like, cause, like, here, here's my oh, phone. <laughs> take my money but i <laughs> on the mcdonald's kiosk like they've made the user experience i guess like optimal and so you actually spend more at mcdonald's the way uh that they have it you don't see how much you're spending because it's like way on the right corner i was like that's really smart but even during covid like when i was working at albertson's um you couldn't go to the grocery store anymore like people are devastated. People like to go to the grocery store and hang out and, you know, search around. I do not. I like getting groceries from my bed, basically, and ordering online. <laughs> but people were resistant. And I think COVID kind of changed the way that people started to use technology. Um, I mean, they reverted back a little bit and they like to go in store. But I think it kind of helped to a certain degree of like, it does save time. It doesn't save money per se, but it does save time. And so, you know, who knows what this this next 15 or 20 years look like? Because I, I'm terrified that there won't be any stores left because I think the alpha generation will do everything. <laughs> they won't go in and anywhere. They just sit on the couch and do everything on their phone. So it'll be really interesting to see how things evolve and change. Yeah, on the on COVID, we actually covered that in the book um, that that I co-authored, and we talked. There was a stat I think from Forrester, and it was a crazy number. It was like over seventy percent of people during COVID completed their first online mm -hmm. transaction. So there are all these people that that were just were like you, Nick. Just ah, I'm not going to order online. I'll just go to the store. I'll do it, you know, the old-fashioned way. 
and they were forced to do it. I always talk my neighbors are 75 years old and they were forced to Instacart. So their daughter set up Instacart. Yeah. They would they would have gone to their graves, never Instacarting, I guarantee yeah. you, had had they not been forced to do it. And today they still Instacart. Yeah. They kind of got to liking it. And now the, when they can go in the store, half the time they Instacart. Well, and you can just think like if Instacart was not a good experience, like just think what would have happened. Because like during COVID, um, I was working at Albertsons and we were just starting to do like, well, I don't want to say starting. We were in the middle of our digital transformation of building our e-commerce site, uh, fill, doing fulfillment because we used to have our own trucks, but they were slightly slow. People weren't getting their orders on time and our checkout was like going down like crazy. And so then COVID hit and then we had to actually mature and be better because um, if not, like customers wouldn't come to us anymore. I and mean, I remember my chief digital officer at the time, she's like, if we were a hospital, we'd be shut down. We were like killing people. <laughs> like, and so she basically shut down our marketing and she did not want us to acquire new customers until we actually fixed the issues and check out um, and our fulfillment, which was great. And she sat uh, us all down, all the leaders. And she read an email of somebody, a 75 year old lady who did not get her order. Uh, it was right in the height of COVID. She's like, am I going to get food? Am I going to starve? Like I waited all night on my porch for my order and you guys didn't even send me an email. We turned that around very quickly because it was, it was people. And, and that's what I think the fundamental thing that companies forget. There are people on the other side. They're waiting for their food. My son right now is waiting for his tennis shoes. He's very distraught every day. He's waiting by the door. Like, is my, is my tennis shoes coming? <laughs> like. People are waiting for their things and they, they're disappointed or excited and companies forget that sometimes. So they shouldn't. So Angel, what's a widely held belief about building frictionless experiences that you fundamentally disagree with? Something you think that people get wrong? Uh, that it's easy. <laughs> Um, I've been doing it for like over 10 years. It is, it is not easy. Um, I think it's coming back in fashion, uh, that you should do personalized experience. And I don't think people understand what it is. Like when I go and do a personalization project with a company, I can ask the CEO, the CMO, uh, the director, technology. I could ask like 20 different people. I will get 20 different answers of like what personalization is. And that's funny because it's personalized answers, but really it's, it's knowing your customer and being able to make their lives easier when they come to your service, retail site, et cetera, um, and helping them. It's not helping yourself. It is, but it's not. Um, you you want to get sales but and have them be loyal, but it's really helping them you know, with their purchase or, or whatever, or helping them find what they need. And so I think a lot of it is when you start it, especially when you, you talk to the marketing team or the CEO, they're like, they see the glossy, we're going to have like personalized marketing campaigns. The website's going to be giving them personalized rec recommendations and next best actions that really it's like, it's a data field. It's cleaning up your data. It's organizing your data. It's getting the data to the right systems. It's integrating those systems. And then it's making the teams work with each other and be customer centric. Um, and so hopefully if anyone who is going through a personalization uh, journey or transformation, by the time they get through it, they have access to the data and they know their customers or the customers that they want better than when they started. So if if you don't have that at the end of your personalization journey, you're probably not doing personalization very well, but it's a, it's a long, ever evolving journey. It never ends. Um, and like I said, I've been doing personalization and the flavors uh, for most of my career and it, it's always changing. And now, now I get to add in AI to it and it's, it's actually really exciting. Um, and I wish more people would be excited about it. It's me. They're not. <laughs> so. I think they're afraid. 
afraid of it taking their jobs, but it's, it's not like. I think they're fatigued by the fact that people like Chuck are out here just saying AI is going to do everything and you can't <laughs> just do everything with AI. That's, that's what I think is happening because I, I think AI is yeah. not a magic bullet, but it is an enhancement. Yeah. An enhancement. I, I think, you know, how I, I, I use AI in, in my gaming things. I, it, it's a helper. It helps you think of things right. that you might not have thought about before. Um, I was trying to have our creative team um, not be fatigued by doing multiples of banners. So if you think about like pet care, everybody has a different kind of breed of dog that has different kind of needs that need different food, different products, different services. And so, you know, just hypothetically, if I'm making a homepage banner, I might need, let's say, 50 or 60 different versions of it based on pet type. Um, does the creative team really want to create like different versions with a different dog and maybe different headline? And it's funny. And I said, you know, it, when we get this personalization thing kind of going, these are the things that I need and I, I don't need bottlenecks in, a, in not a bad way, but it's bottlenecks and period. And I said, do you really want to create like 50 different, 50 plus different versions of banners? And they're like, yes, we do. And I was like, no, you don't. No, you don't. And so, <laughs> but I think it goes back to like, it's a, it's a partnership of like, I, I'm empathetic to your fears of AI, but we also need to think about, are we making these banners and experiences fast enough for our customers? Because if I'm a cat owner, why are you showing me a dog? Like, I don't have a dog. I don't want dog food. Show me a cat and show me my version cat that I have, because that will make it know, or it will make it feel like you know me and I want to shop with you then. That is probably the best use I've heard for personalized AI, yeah. like ever. Like, and I literally have three dogs at my feet right now laying here. If I logged on to Petco versus Chewy and you showed me an Italian Greyhound and a Border Collie, I would absolutely change yeah. my loyalty just because of that. Because it's... It's showing that, hey, not only are you going to give me the the images that match my life, you're also going to give me the products that match my dog. And that expectation is is absolutely like just it, it's a it's a A equals C, A equals B, B equals U. It's one of those situations, but it is something that customers will do. And I can already see it happening, right? Just like yeah. on the implication. That is a really, well, really cool and, experience. And it's kind of funny. You, you asked this question earlier of like, why do uh, companies not focus on customers? And I think that there's like this thought that customers know what they want and, and they are kind of coming in sort of experts. But I remember at Sephora, we were doing a skincare campaign and basically customers don't know what types of skincare and what order they need to have. And so uh, females have to get probably five or six different products um, in order to do a, a skincare regime. And so a lot of times if you're selling like very expensive serums and uh, oils and different face creams and eye creams, there's like a hundred dollars plus. Um, and you're supposed to buy them in, a, in kind of a package. But if you have different skin types, you need to be kind of trained on what skin types and products that you need to have. And so when we were kind of uh, building these things out, customers didn't know. And so we had to help train them to a certain degree and give them tools um, and wizards and different like devices so they can kind of figure out the right products. And so I think sometimes um, companies don't think like that, like, you know, I'm going into Home Depot and I'm going to buy a saw. Like, what kind of saw? There's like 50 different saws there and, and different products. And so you really have to create the collateral for the products as well. And so I think that's that's another thing with like kind of personalization that people kind of forget of like, it's not just, hey, buy this drill because you bought this other thing. What are all of the, the educational marketing pieces that kind of go with it? Um, to kind of keep that customer sort of satisfied. So I think that's another another thing of like 
personalization teams are relatively big. Um, they need a lot of feed and caring. <laughs> like, so I think if if companies are starting to think like that, like they need to really invest in in the teams because they're the the front line to the customer. That's awesome. So uh, Angel, what are one or two final recommendations for listeners that they can take back to their own roles to drive frictionless experience? I think, you know, one, just knowing your customer um, and, and trying to get your hands on whatever data that you can um, and research and, and really look at your customer base and then the customers that you, you're trying to attain. Um, if you don't have it, then that's your probably your number one problem of like, you need to go back and get the data and get the teams um, kind of rallied around like customer. I think then it's, you know, what are the technologies and the things or the things that you're trying to do and the technology associated with it. So if you're trying to create like a personalized uh, customer experience campaign on digital, is your digital experience perfect? Um, if not, fix those things and then personalize. It's like, you don't want to have a personalized uh a really terrible experience. That's not going to help you whatsoever. Um, and then start to look outward. Look at your marketing campaigns and your store experiences because really personalization is tying the complete customer journey from I'm thinking about this place to buying the thing to buying the next thing to learning more about buying the next thing. And then it's that generation of like, who's the next generation I'm going to go after? Um, can I get their parents excited? Or can I get them excited? Uh, Sephora's done a, like I said, Home Depot and Sephora's done an awesome job. Like there are 10 year olds at Sephora right now. And so, you know, I think you always have to kind of be thinking about the next, next thing. And don't be afraid of things like AI. Don't maybe like saturate it, but think of how it could be used because one way or another, these new technologies um, are going to be coming in and you're going to have to figure it out. Um, and not be scared of it. So those would be, I think I gave you three takeaways, but three or four takeaways. That's awesome. This has been a great conversation, Angel. What's the best way if people want to reach out to you, connect with you, what's the best way for them to LinkedIn, do that? LinkedIn, um, I'm always on LinkedIn more than I probably should be, but I'm always there. So come find me, uh, find me on my game website when it launches, that will be exciting. Um, but yeah, I, I'll probably be more on LinkedIn. I'm trying to do my own like little uh, sharing of knowledge. And so, yeah, but thank you guys so much. This has been really fun. Well, thank you for, for coming on. And we'll, if your uh, gaming website launches by the time this episode okay. publishes, we'll put the link okay. in the show notes. Yeah, it's you. actually just like richcircus.com. It's already, it's already kind of there. It has all the basic inf information. Perfect. Perfect. Everybody go check out that game. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for listening to this episode. Be sure to, to check us out on your favorite podcast player app and subscribe. So you get notified every time we have a new episode. Also leave us a review. Let us know what we can do better. And you can always find Nick and me on LinkedIn. I am at Chuck Moxley and Nick is at in Paladino. Thanks for joining us for another insightful episode of The Frictionless Experience. We've had a fascinating conversation with Angel Singh from Petco about the challenges and opportunities in creating seamless customer experiences. Let's recap some key takeaways. One, knowing your customer is fundamental. Many companies don't truly understand who their customers are or who they want to acquire. Invest in data collection, analysis, and research to build a comprehensive understanding of your current and target customers. Absolutely, Chuck. And here's another point. Break down organizational silos. The structure of teams within a company can significantly impact customer experience. Foster cross-functional collaboration and consider having teams that work horizontally across the organization. Focus on the customer journey rather than just vertical department goals and maybe even have a board game day together. <laughs> That's a great point, Nick. Angel also shared an interesting insight about technology integration. You should ensure that your foundational technologies are working well before adding more complex solutions. For example, make sure your basic digital experience is solid before trying to implement personalization. It's not helpful to personalize a poor user experience. And finally, Embrace new technologies like AI, but use them thoughtfully. 
AI can be a powerful tool for enhancing customer experiences such as creating personalized content at scale. However, it's not a magic bullet. It's an enhancement to your existing strategies and should be implemented with clear objectives in mind. We hope you can apply these to your own customer experience strategies. Remember, creating a frictionless experience is an ongoing process and that requires constant attention to customer needs, technological advancements, and organizational alignment. That's right, Chuck. We hope you found this episode valuable. Don't forget to subscribe to The Frictionless Experience and leave us a review. We'll see you in the next one.